I was given this uh, um, opportunity to talk about games are good, um, and uh, as, a, as, a, as a topic, I thought it's way too big, and I, there's no way I'm going to be able to cover anything. So uh, I hope that you understand that this is going to be fairly overall general kind of thoughts, I hope that are relevant. Uh, and I noticed this morning when I was just like looking at my LinkedIn, the developments that we are currently facing in the games industry are going so fast that we, we it's, it, it's, it's almost as if we can't keep up with them. I was just seeing this morning, there's a, a Katarina Kozinska, you may know her, she's the um, young woman who produced the very first graphic novel produced uh, by AI, and, and then there was the huge hullabaloo around the uh, copyright, uh, etc. This morning she showed a game that she'd made in five minutes, um, and you can check it out, it's, it's quite interesting. Okay. Uh, William Easton, I'm, uh, I'm the head of Future Games. I've been working in education for quite some time. In fact, my very first job for you Polish speakers um, byłem profesor szkoły sztuk plastycznej w Łodzi, 85 lat, 85. To to taki był straszny, to był stan wojenny. So, bardzo interesujące. Um, so, uh, but I'll go back into English again, which is at least better. Um, yeah, I've been doing education for a long time in lots of different areas. So, um, um, but I'm going to be talking about uh, things. Now, I, I began by saying, pointing out the obvious. I mean, you know, we've got three billion active game players. We have, uh, you know, an industry that's set to be worth half a trillion US dollars by 2028. In Sweden, uh, a year ago, maybe two years ago, the games industry went beyond the uh, forestry industry. And the forestry industry for maybe as many as, maybe almost a thousand years, has been one of the cornerstones of the Swedish economy. And when games goes beyond that, you begin to realize just how important this is. It's a global cultural heritage that spans generations. We now have games which are retro games of retro games. So, I mean, I, we, we talked about it this morning, and I'm not quite sure, but I think 10 generations, something like that, would be about right. So it means we're actually into a different kind of cultural object. And I threw this last word in here, Gesamtkunstwerk. Um, this is Richard Wagner in the middle of the 19th century. Wagner's concept that the future of art would become these combined forms of art. You know, of course, he meant opera. You know, it was like a bit of theater and music and stuff added together. Uh, and then for many years, Gesamtkunstwerk was used to talk about architecture. You know, architecture was a Gesamtkunstwerk because it had different aspects. There is nothing that comes close to what games are doing as a cultural form, as a Gesamtkunstwerk today. Nothing close. And I'm not going to dwell on this, but I... I find myself occasionally at odds with some of my colleagues in Sweden anyway, when we talk about games as culture. The tendency that I've noticed is that people talk about games as culture as being um, related to the aesthetics of games, right? Now, I have a background in art, and I used to run a center of contemporary art in Sweden, and I've been engaged in contemporary art for a long time. I'm not sure that games are interesting as a cultural form because of their aesthetics. That's not what makes them an incredibly exciting potential cultural form played across. It's much more related to the way that they tap into community, the way that they connect people. And equally, the, the, the way in which um, gameplay becomes the central focus of what you do. That in itself becomes the cultural form, not the look of the game or the sound or the lighting or anything else. That's an aspect of it, but it's actually the much more complex cultural formation. And I think that's incredibly exciting and, and I think it opens up another way of looking at it as a cultural object. Of course games are, you know, reflecting who we are right now, probably better than anything else. We had another conversation this morning, which was simply that the production time for making a game is so long now that the danger is by the time the game gets released, it's already out of date, right? Which is an intriguing point, which I think AI will rectify very, very quickly. Um, 
So it's a cultural heritage. Games are not just a entertainment or a, or a pastime. It is something that fundamentally is helping to construct society. Um, an interconnected, self-perpetuating worldwide community that operates locally and internationally. I think we all understand this. I mean, anybody who plays games knows that the way that games are connecting to people, they happen on the global scale, they can happen locally, they can happen with tighter, smaller groups, and huge, massive, enormous communities of people. Really intriguing, I think many of you probably have seen this, and a game that was released very, relatively recently called Battle Bit Remastered, as I hope some of you have seen it. Uh, it managed to have three million downloads in three weeks from Steam. Um, and it's basically Battleground, but, but with better gameplay, right? What is interesting about that game, three people made the game, it took them seven years to make a future points in another direction. What's really interesting is that the focus of the game is on the game play and not on the aesthetics. The game does not look great. It looks like a Roblox, Roblox game, but it's an extraordinarily enjoyable game to play. And that's what ties people together. That's what people comment upon. Esports as the fastest growing global sport worth 1.72 million, blah, blah, blah. You know, honestly, I don't want to go into this. It's just to recognize that the games are moving into other areas where actually it's challenging other traditional forms of culture. So, as I said, this is pointing out the obvious. Uh, I think none of this stuff is news to anybody. But the future is already here. It's just not very well distributed. This is probably the most famous quote from William Gibson. And unfortunately, I have recently discovered he may not have actually ever said it. And, and a lot of people actually disagree with him. But my point is very obvious. You don't have to project what's going to happen in the future. You just have to look at what's already going on. I, I'm not going to make speculations about where games are going to be in five years' time. It's enough just to see what's already happening to be able to get a glimpse of this incredible new um, change in what's happening. So, you know, McKinsey reckons that the, uh, the metaverse will generate $5 trillion by 2030. Um, to take the consultancy, see that digital twins will mirror entire enterprises. This is already happening, as you probably already know. The whole of Seoul in South Korea is already a metaverse where you can do all your business with the city as an avatar with other avatars. That's already here. It's been up and running for more than a year. And this is going to be a kind of like a new way of thinking. And it already is. Uh, AI will remove 1 billion jobs globally by 2030 and will create 97 million new jobs generating $15.7 trillion. That's the World Economic Forum saying this. So it's not, I'm not, I'm not, again, I'm not suggesting things I think will happen. This is what we're already thinking is already in, in place. Um, I think this last part is something that both frightens but also excites. And we have to look at what that means. So, I'm, I don't think I'm the first person to say this, but we're at a tipping point. We are at an incredible tipping point, not just for the future of games, but for the future of human society. Um, and we are, it's a revolution that is going to affect every single aspect of life. And um, more importantly, it's something that is already underway and it's already having its effects. I think the reduction in um, hiring for asset production, for games production in China dropped by something like 6% in the last three months, which is significant. So we're already seeing the effects, but I would say it's never been so exciting to be working in the creative industries. We are standing at this amazing jumping off point for a total new way of thinking about what games are, what they might become, and how we interact with them. Two thoughts here. One is that um, uh, somebody said recently, and I like this comment, Indie games will become AAA, and AAA will have to become something totally different. I think it's a good way of thinking about it, because the speed of production, the, the capacity to produce something of a high level is going to become so much faster that smaller indie companies are going to be able to do things which are now just in the province of, 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 of big AAA companies. So I am very positive, 
Um, so what are the future-proof skills? I'm a teacher. I've been doing this for a long time. Um, yeah, the future-proof skills that we need to work on are analytical and creative thinking, flexibility, agility, curiosity, and lifelong learning. These will not disappear. It doesn't matter what we're doing in terms of um, how AI chatbots might educate programmers, for example, which Harvard already have today. So they, you, you, you can study a programming course, and 90% of the responses you need from your C++ um, trainer is coming from a chatbot. Now, this is already here, um, but these skills don't disappear. These, these are the things that we need to focus on. And as a school, and as a teacher, that's what I'm thinking. This is an incredible opportunity. Um, AI is a force for democratic, inclusive, non-proprietary, adaptive, and sustainable change. Blah. Too many words there. But the, my, ex, what I find exciting about the prospect is that we can actually see something very, very positive emerging for all human society with the development of, of AI. And I did add the non-proprietary moment in there. Um, you may have seen Tim Sweeney from Epic talking about what he sees as the future of the metaverse. I think one of the most interesting metaphors that he uses, he says that the, the metaverse will be like email. Now, what he means is that it's one system that everybody has to use together. You can't build your own and run it and expect to be connected. It self-regulates because it's necessary for it to function that it has to be non-proprietary. No one can own it and control it, not one company or one place. And it's inevitable that that will happen. So I took one quote with me, which is quite long, but um, I liked the quote. This is from uh, jo Josh Simmons from, from Harvard. Um, what strikes me about this is when he says, we can only build structures of governance and regulation for AI, machine learning, and algorithm for wrestling with questions about the character of our shared world and how we relate to one another's co-inhabitants of physical and digital spaces. And this ultimately is what democracy is for. So AI can be viewed in a very positive prospect of actually introducing the, the greater equality, greater democracy, because those structures that are necessary in order to make it work will, need, will be readily shared and will have to be something that adheres to those um, those, those institutions and processes that we have in civil society. So I am ultimately positive. And I'm going to leave you with three metaphors. This is my very bad joke. I'm sorry about that. I, when I came out with it, I couldn't resist it. I, um, yeah. Okay, so here's my first metaphor. Uh, the, 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 the image on the, on the left is the very, very first selfie. Um, it's the very first picture of a person taking a picture of themselves. And the other two are similar. The woman in the middle is using a box brownie, so you can get the date around that. It would be around about 1880, 1890, something like that. And the, the one on the right is, a, is, is similar from the same kind of period. It's also a, a daguerreotype. But, okay, why did I throw this up? I thought about the invention of photography, right? Now, this is my metaphor. Photography was invented. Portrait painting didn't disappear, but actually portrait painting kind of changed radically. I mean, photography simply was a better way of taking images of people. Okay, that's not that interesting. The interesting thing for me is that very rapidly, photography became an art form in its own right. So to think about where, what we're stepping into, we have to think about this as developing its own potential cultural significance, not to fear for the fact that we're losing something else. Just as photography automatically, very, very quickly, produced something that changed the very nature of representation. So my first metaphor is that don't be fearful if you're a game artist. Don't be fearful that you're not going to have a job in the future. Think about the potential of what you can do as Artists did with the invention of photography. What is how we're going to make sense of this in the future? My second metaphor is these three people. Uh, you may not recognize them, but the one on the left is Pina Bausch, the uh, German uh, choreographer and theater director. The one in the middle is Bertolt Brecht. You might have recognized him. And the one on the right is Peter Hall. My metaphor here is very straightforward. The future of 
the roles that we will have in game development are going to be increasingly closer to what a theater director does. Now, a theater director works with lighting and sound and staging and casting and the whole shebang that connects around the creation of a performance, right? And that, 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 that idea that you're, you are working in real time to manipulate on a real-time stage where you are changing things is a role that is emerging rapidly in the games industry and I think becomes an incredibly exciting creative role, right? It's not the same as being the person who produces X. It's the person who is seeing the whole picture and being able to work in real time to make it actually function. Recently, I've been talking to an awful lot of important people within the games industry in Sweden because we're developing new educations and we're looking about what we need to include in it. This came back over and over and over again. The necessity for people to understand the big picture of how things are functioning. And I think that offers an incredibly exciting prospect. So it's about collaboration. It's about understanding each other. It's about understanding systems. It's about knowing enough about programming the system of programming without necessarily having to code. It's about understanding that, as, as I think Brenda Braithwaite says, the mechanic is the message, right? The, the, the mechanic of games are the narrative elements that create exciting games, right? And understanding those processes is what you need to have. You don't need to be able to be, a, everybody doesn't have to be a level designer. So that's my second metaphor. And my last one is bees. Um, bees are pretty weird, right? Um, bees live in a hive, and if they're fed the right stuff, they change into something else, right? You, you feed the, the, a, a bee royal jelly, and it turns into a queen. You feed it another thing, it becomes a drone. You feed it something else, it becomes a worker. You feed it something else, it becomes the guard outside the hive. Education will become much more like this hive, this globally connected hive, where we are finding those roles that are necessary to keep the whole hive together. So I am extremely positive about that, that prospect. I am excited by the idea of education that isn't so longer formulaic, that everybody has to reach a certain point at a certain time, but rather people can develop as they want to in the speed that's necessary to, to, to contribute to the whole together. That's an incredibly exciting prospect. Education has been a pile of shit. Sorry, I shouldn't swear. But it's been rubbish. Our education system has been useless for such a long time. We have, been, we have, we have created an education that is actually not delivering. It doesn't deliver for people or for society. I did a project, I'm going to end here, I did a project a few, a few years ago um, with uh, a bunch of Ericsson and a bunch of other Swedish companies looking at university education. I'm, I'm not dissing universities. But we, we looked at, we, we ran a, a, a mechanic model on testing the, um, testing the effectiveness of education. So we asked, we, we said, okay, certain parameters, are you delivering on them? Are you producing what's necessary, right? And, um, one of the things we said was, how often was the PhD that was written at a university uh, borrowed from the library of that university? And the le levels were so low, when we ran the, 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 the little treatment, we, it wasn't that the machine, wasn't it wasn't that the machine was working badly. We came to the conclusion the machine hadn't even been turned on. Um, in certain areas, it was zero. So all these people working for years to produce materials never actually had them re read ever again. They just disappeared into the vacuum of an academic something. Early education is equally bad. We have created an education where we have completely set everything in terms of like everybody has to reach a certain point together. We are going to, I think we have an opportunity to abandon that and really confront the individual, their needs, and the relationship to the whole. Okay, so I hope that gave you something to think about anyway. Um, and I am, as I said, I think games are good and they'll just get better and better. They're going to become more exciting. Thank you. Thank you.